So, so far we've been talking about the groundwater zone and dissolution and transport in the groundwater zone. So we're thinking, I guess, about this uh, area here. Um, this is the source. The plume goes down from this. Uh, we know that uh, these materials, uh, are, if they're non-conservative, or even if they're conservative, can be defined by a retardation coefficient, which is one if it's uh, conservative, and greater than one if it's non-conservative. The retardation factor really means it's the ratio of the velocity for the conservative tracer versus the divided by the non-conservative tracer. And physically what it means is that the front moves forward more slowly by a factor that's reduced the length traveled by a factor of r, and the travel time is increased by that same factor of r, and it may be that the height of this is reduced by attenuation as it sorbs onto the component. We saw last time that we can get estimates of this Kd for solvents from two different ways, from octanol water partition coefficients for those solvents or from their solubilities. They must be related in some way. And that can define that for us if we want to. And also, if you want to calculate the mass in place, uh, we typically have to include not only the mass which is included within the fluid, which would be the underlying portion here, but also uh, the mass which is included, sorbed onto the solid. And we can get that easily just by multiplying through by, straightforwardly multiplying through by the, the um, retardation coefficient. So now, uh, as we go into another topic, we'd like to know how we can define those same kinds of behaviors, transport away from a zone that is held in place in the Vado zone, so above the water table, uh, and to look at the mechanisms of transport in which it might be removed from being held by the capillary forces and dumped into the, uh, uh, the groundwater zone, or be able to off-gas. So that's our, our job today. And so, we will look at these uh, behaviors. So we'll look at mechanisms of transport, um, which would be both diffusion and advection, these two here. And we'll also talk about the effects of partitioning, which gives us retardation. So the mechanisms by which partitioning occurs and how it gives us a, a retardation factor which we'd like to know because that also governs the behavior of our s system. And I guess the other thing I didn't mention in our recap was we can also define uh, if it doesn't satisfy those simple plug flow equations, we can also use the Peclé number, which is the velocity times a length over a diffusion coefficient, which is unchanged. And we can also use um, pore volumes, which is uh, a velocity times time, is that right? That will give you a length divided by a length traveled, and it would be multiplied, um, divided by r, I guess, right? Because velocity is an advective velocity, and in our advection dispersion equation, it's velocity divided by retardation, velocity divided by retardation, but also dispersion divided by retardation. And so we can use those expressions just with the addition of this parameter. Peckley number is unchanged, uh, but uh, pore volumes is changed. And so we'd need more pore volumes uh, to get a breakthrough than because it's uh, attached onto the substrate that it's flowing through. So that's what we will uh, talk about today. So we're talking about the stuff that's locked in the Vado zone. And again, well, this is uh, cultural uh, spelling of vaporization, so Canadian spelling <laughs> of vaporization, which is where this been, has been taken for. So the idea is that you'd have a spill. It's held in the, the Vado zone above the water table. Uh, it's held there by capillary forces. Uh, maybe it's there as a smear or as a residual component. And then it can diffuse away, just like it would be in the, but now the diffusion, instead of being in water, would be in the gas phase within the porous medium. The vapors are probably denser than air, and they would uh, be, have negative buoyancy, so they would drop and they would uh, 
move towards the capillary fringe in the water table. Where they contact that, they would tend to uh, be, um, they could partition into the water and be carried as a plume in the groundwater zone, whichever way the, f the flow is occurring. And also as it flows in the um, Vado zone, it can sorb onto both the soil and also onto the fluids that's present at residual um, saturations perhaps in the soil. So these are the, the mechanisms that we could imagine happening. And so in terms of transport, we'll talk about two of them. We'll talk about the first two of these. The last one's a bit more complicated, um, where vapors drop onto the water table and get incorporated in the water table. But we'll talk about diffusion only. So you have it locked here, and it can off-gas, and it can go up to the surface or down to the uh, groundwater table. And the case uh, which turns out to be a much more effective way of removing the components is by advection in a water phase. So it rains on the ground surface, the rainwater infiltrates, it goes through this residual chimney, and it takes a portion of this residual chimney dissolved in water that arrives on the water table, and then it gets carried uh, by the, the motion of the, the groundwater. So those are the two that we'll talk about, and we'll talk about them in turn. First diffusion, and then advection. So that's what we'll, we'll deal, deal with today. Uh, do we need that? Uh, no. Well, only to say that the, if we're dealing with partitioning and sorption, we can use kind of similar equations that we've used before. We haven't used this yet, but this is Henry's Law, which defines how dissolved components in the water are partitioned in the water and are equilibrium with their vapor pressure above the, outside the water. And so this is Henry's law coefficient defines the ratio right, basically of the concentration in the gas phase to the concentration in the water phase. It's just that the concentration in the gas phase is often defined by a partial pressure of that component, uh, which we'll look at a bit later. And we can also imagine that if we have a cocktail of components, then the concentration, the saturation, if you like, of a single component is controlled by Raoult's law, which is that the molar fraction of that portion in the cocktail defines how much would be present in the gas phase uh, relative to what's present in the cocktail. So this would be the, uh, sorry, this would be the, the free phase solubility in gas, and it's reduced according to the proportion of that in the cocktail, but it's not just a straight weight proportion, it's a proportion based on uh, molar concentration, which we talked about last time. And we'll talk about a bit about that later. So these rules pervade what we're attempting to do here. So if we want to look at the first of these mechanisms uh, in terms of diffusive transport, then what we can do is we can go back to fixed law for diffusion only, where we have no advection. And this must look uh, moderately familiar. This is fixed first law. And it is the concentration gradient multiplied by a diffusion coefficient, which would be fixed law. But because the flow is only in the open pore space, the gas-filled pore space, this pre-multiplier is the, the volumetric gas content. So this would be the proportion of the, aquif of the total volume of a piece of the aquifer that is gas-filled. So it's the, the gas-filled void volume divided by the total volume of the aquifer, which we've defined many times. And this would be a diffusive mass flux, so mass per unit area per unit time, which is traveling. And all to say that what we would do with that would be that we would add that to a fixed second law, which is something like a conservation equation, mass accumulation, mass in minus mass out. If you do it only in the uh, x direction, this gets put into this. And if you manipulate it around, you get something like this, second order PDE. This first order becomes a second order PDE. And 
I haven't, I've just pulled this out of a hat, but you can imagine that just like flow in the subsurface, um, if it's non-conserved, if it can be removed from the gas air phase onto the solid substrate, it would respond to a retardation coefficient. And this will be a different one from we've had before. It's responded to for gas flow, which we'll talk about later. So this is the, the law that is defining our behavior. And so if we expect, if we think about what that means in terms of our concentration that we have centered at zero radius, if we were not retarded, then at a given time, we know how to calculate the form of this normal probability distribution, and we have an expression from it, from 3.1, I think it was. It's a 1 minus a complementary error function term. It depends on the diffusive diffusion coefficient, and it would say that it's gone a certain distance in a given time. So a snapshot in time, high concentration, concentration of one relative concentrations at the source, zero a long way away, and we can map between them. And what the retardation coefficient means is that if this is two, it would have traveled half as far uh, in the, that given time than if it was conservative. So, so we know exactly what that means. And we could use the other equations we've had for this as, as well, so long as we know what these uh, it, it, given coefficients are. So part of our job will be to figure out exactly what this gaseous diffusion coefficient would be and what this retardation coefficient would be. I guess that's the first order of business. So in terms of effective diffusion coefficient, uh, this would be the straight reference book uh, value, which would be my aftershave diffusing in this room in air. Right? So the free phase dif diffusion in air um, if there was nothing else. And you need to correct it for the tortuosity. So if it's, it's flowing between A and B, the tortuosity would be the length it has to travel as an equivalent flow path relative to the, as the crow flies between two points uh, line of flight. So this will always be less than one, so squared is also less than one, so it reduces this by some amount. So that's one way to do that, if we could know exactly what this different tortuous flow path uh, would be. Or we could use other empirical correlations, and the most commonly used is Millington and Quirk from a fair while ago. Uh, but it's just given, it gives you a value of this tortuosity as a function of the volumetric gas content to the power of 7 over 3 divided by the total uh, moisture content, which is really, really the, um, the porosity. So this, the maximum value of this would be uh, porosity. In other words, when all the pores are f not filled with anything except gas, but of course what they can be filled with is they can be filled with water. And so that's why the gas-filled porosity isn't necessarily the same as the um, total porosity, right? And so if you use this, this is a s to the power 2 on the bottom, 7 over 3 on the top. And if you do this for an imaginary vertical column uh, through from the ground surface to the groundwater table, we know that the um, saturation versus depth or capillary pressure curve looks like this. This could be capillary pressure or it could be equivalent depth, right? We know that they're linked to each other. This would be the tension saturated zone. This would be where there's a big uh, volumetric uh, gas content and a small water content, a relatively smaller gas content and a big water content. They, they switch out. And of course, when you get to the water table, there's zero gas at all. So if you go through this and just apply this tortuosity equation to the gas uh, diffusion coefficient in air, which is 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. Uh, in water, we talked about it before, perhaps three orders of magnitude less than this. Yeah, not quite three, a little bit less than three. And if you wanted to use that to calculate exactly what this gas con 
gas uh, diffusion coefficient was. <clears throat> we do it by calculating the volumetric gas content, which if this is the porosity is 35%. That means this is 10%, this is 25%. And so if you use uh, this, um, yes, 35% here. And calculate this value of tau, multiply tau by the gas diffusion coefficient, you end up with these one. So close to where it's close to the surface, it has the highest value, 10 to the minus 6. As the porosity gets shut down, so it's a very small gaseous porosity, then it also reduces this by two orders of magnitude. And if you want to use a diffusion coefficient below the water table, you're not going to use the gas coefficient at all, but you use the, the water, the modified. This would be what we've called DL is equal to D star plus alpha times V, right? This is our expression. So in this, we're assuming that this is zero, and so that we're getting this value of D star. And so this is still one or, well, yeah, close to one order of magnitude less than this as well. So much slower in water than in air. So that's the first of our parameters. So now we know something about how to get the value of a um, di effective diffusion coefficient. So now we want to see what the effects of retardation might be. And so we have to figure out what that partitioning could be. And so the easiest way to think about it, and I'll come back to this, is if you think of your porous medium, we know that uh, for many porous medium, certainly those that are water wet, there'll be this sheath of water around the grains. And uh, in the areas that are bubbles, which are open pores, that non-wetting fluid is the gas, which will fill the big open pore voids. So we know that the grains are completely sheathed in water, and the voids, uh, the pore space that's gas-filled, is outside that. So if we want to have a connection between the air to the water to the solid, it has to go across these. So we only have to consider partitioning air to water and water to gas, and they should all be in equilibrium with each other. That's what Henry's law says. So what we'll consider is the concentration that's present in gas form. That will partition to the water, or vice versa. An equilibrium concentration in the water will give us a gas concentration. And likewise, the water will be in equilibrium with the solid, because these are equilibrium processes over a long period of time. So we can consider both the gas-water partitioning and the water-solid partitioning separately. The uh, gas-water partitioning is given by uh, Henry's law. We said Henry's law before is really the ratio between the concentration in the gas of the solvent and the concentration dissolved in water of that solvent. It just happens that it's usually defined as this H prime variable, which is in strange units, because the concentration in water is a mass per unit volume, and the concentration in the gas form is given as a partial pressure. And so that's fine. We could use that uh, if we wanted to, but it's actually a bit more convenient for us to use a Henry's law coefficient, which is modified, which uses the concentrations in the gas and the water, but they're in the same units. If they're in the same units, then by definition, this has no dimensions and it's just a bit more convenient uh, for us. So all we have to do is figure out how to get from this form when we can get a value of H prime from a, um, a textbook of um, a reference book of Henry's law coefficients and convert it into this, and we'll do that. So gas to water partitioning is defined by Henry's law. The, and we'll talk about how to get H in a moment. The water to solid partitioning is given by this. You remember that we had, um, what was it? KD is equal to, what was it? C star over C aqueous, right? Or the other way around, I can't remember. 
you remember we had this curve. Concentration in the aqueous form, concentration on the solid. We thought we could do an experiment that would give us these values and draw a straight line through it. And the value of this was just 1 over kd. So that's, that's what this is. And from this we could use, uh, sometimes we could use our octanol organic carbon partition coefficients coming from solubility or octanol water parameters and the fraction of organic carbon to get this or otherwise we could get it some other way. But if we could get it, then we ended up with a retardation coefficient, which was equal to 1 plus density of the aquifer, uh, volumetric moisture content, and KD. I guess, I, yeah. I usually write it as lowercase k, lowercase d, but that doesn't matter. So if we take this in the water and think about how that might work with these two components, first from the gas to the water given by Henry's law, and then from the water to the solid given by this standard distribution coefficient definition. And I won't derive it, but we end up with a new um, retardation coefficient. So this is for the gas, and it has two components. It has the one that we already had, but it has the part that gives us uh, water to solid, So some concentration at solubility in the water sorbing onto the solid grains, and we also have uh, water air, I guess. Water to air. And you see that it includes a volumetric moisture content of water, if it's in the Vado zone, uh, and the volumetric constant due to the gas. So I guess if you take those by definition phi W plus phi gas would equal porosity, right? What isn't filled up with water has to be filled with gas. That has to be the total pore space. And so if you add the two volumetric uh, contents, those have to equal the porosity. So that defines what these are. And this is just our regular one, except we have this extra term, which factors in here. So if we're in the Vado zone, we can calculate what both of those are. And all we have to now know is what our reference text value of this non-dimensional Henry's Law coefficient is. And then we can define exactly what the retardation factor is. OK? Um, so fine. Don't want to talk about that. Let's pretend that we know, uh, we could come back to this. If we know what the Henry's Law coefficient is, it actually turns out to be numbers that are relatively small. And remember that Henry's Law represents the ratio of concentrations in gas to water, just so I have that right. In the same units as mass per unit volume. So if we knew what this Henry's Law coefficient we can look at an aquifer which has both um, low amount of organic carbon and high amount of organic carbon. You remember we said we probably shouldn't use it unless it was bigger than 0.1 of a, a percent of fractional organic carbon. So this is a bit small to, to get away with using that. But if we take these two aquifers with low organic carbon and higher organic carbon, we can calculate the magnitudes of these two terms. The stuff that's sorbed between water and air, and the stuff that's sorbed between water and solid, and see exactly what their effects are. And so if we calculate the magnitudes of those coefficients, so this is water, air, the value for this uh, partition coefficient is independent of the amount of organic carbon in the aquifer, and so it's always this small number. It's not very big. Remember, we're going to add these together. It's going to be uh, 1 plus this term plus this term is going to be our retardation. So I guess this could be 1. Oops. So that's what we're doing. And so these don't change at all with organic 
carbon fraction, but the ones which rely on the value of distribution coefficient, which is a linear function of the um, proportion of carbon. So if there's 100 times more carbon, then this term becomes 100 times larger. So instead of being 0.27, which contributes insignificantly to this, and this is mainly dominated by the gaseous sorption, all of a sudden, if you have a lot of sorption on your aquifer, not surprisingly, it multiplies and this becomes a much larger number. And this is big, as big as the biggest, largest of the numbers <coughs> that we looked at last time for the rather badly produced re table of different sites around the world, where the biggest ones were of the order of uh, 30. So, so long as we can get the magnitude of this Henry's Law coefficient, we're able to do that. In this particular case, we've just assumed, calculate, assumed a, a real value, but we haven't talked about how we might calculate it. So the other consequence of this is that if you look at the impact of these two different retardation coefficients, we have two. So we have one for the flow in the groundwater, which is this, from yesterday or from Tuesday and last Thursday. And we have one in the groundwater zone. And so what that means is that this title of this is differential retardation. It sounds a very gl a grand uh, term, but merely refers to the fact that if we had um, something sitting in the Vado zone, and that was able to contact with the groundwater zone, and you looked at two monitoring locations, one in the Vado zone and one in the groundwater zone, um, the Vado zone could be traveling by advection or diffusion, didn't matter. Or the groundwater could be just by diffusion or by advection as well. But the, the sequence of arrival of the different contaminants as they arrive at each of these monitoring locations is controlled by their retardation coefficients. The ones that are most retarded will, re, will arrive late, latest because they'll take longest to travel from what we know about. So what we could do is we could assume values of the bulk distribution coefficient, the aqueous retardation coefficient will come from this, and the gaseous one will come from that, if we know what Henry's Law are, for each of these three components, TCE, TCA, and methylene chloride. So we can use that to calculate the aqueous retardation, and so the, most, uh, the least retarded, and so the first arrival will be the first one here, and then the second and the third one, because these are in sequence of the magnitudes of the retardation factors in the aqueous phase, in the groundwater phase. So in groundwater, they'll arrive first, second, and third. But if you look at the retardation coefficients in the gas phase, then this will arrive first, this will arrive second, and this will arrive third. So these two are switched backwards these two. Instead of being one, two, three, they change their order. And so that merely is a consequence of us looking at the magnitudes of the retardation factors and really understanding exactly what it means is that it's the amount of delay that it takes in getting from A to B. The larger this number, the larger the delay, and therefore you can scale the arrivals of those because they're both being carried by the same agents. It's either advection that's carrying them, or it's just by straight diffusion, then in either case they would be limited by those amounts. So, so this also has assumed that we know what this value of uh, H is. I'll come back to this. I don't want to do this. So how do we get this all-important uh, value? So this is what we want, uh, because it's easy for us. If these are in the same units, then this is dimensionless. This is how it comes to us. If you look it up in a, a reference manual, it's in units of, uh, what's it in? It's in, uh, let's be at the bottom here. Atmosphere meters cubed per mole. And so they're in this rather bizarre units. And so if we want to move from one to the other, we just need to figure out exactly what these terms are. So this is our aqueous concentration. This would be our solubility. We've talked about it in terms of uh, 1,100 milligrams per liter or 1,100 parts per million. 
You can also define solubility in water in moles per cubic meter of water. And so if we can define it in that term, then that's great. We can also define the partial pressure in terms of our ideal gas law. Absolute pressure, um, density, uh, universal gas constant, the molar weight of the solvent, and the absolute temperature. If you substitute that into here, then we get this term down here. If we take the terms that we want to group together, then we would group these together. So density divided by molecular mass would be the number of moles per unit volume of the uh, gaseous compound and concentration of water in water would be the number of moles in water uh, in water and so these these terms here this term here would actually be the uh, by definition the ratio of g over water which is our definition here so this This outline term is just the concentration in gas, and this is the concentration water. They're in like units, so the ratio of them is just this value of H that we've defined. And so that means that if that's the expression for uh, H, then we can just write H in, by dividing both sides through by R bar T bar t and we end up with this so it's quite straightforward so you take the value that you pull out of your reference manual you divide it by the universal gas constant and the absolute temperature uh, that you're at and then the magnitude of h that you get is this and so you can check the units but it works out and so if you do it just for an example this is the henry's law coefficient for tce if you do that for um, universal gas constant, which is this, at 20 degrees centigrade, I guess, 293 Kelvin, uh, and it turns out that the non-dimensional Henry's law coefficient is about 0.4, and the units should all drop out. So we know how to get that. So if we can get that, then we always know exactly how to get these retardation coefficients. So we can use that. The final thing to talk about in terms of this differential retardation, going back to that, is if we know what the magnitudes of these retardation coefficients are from this expression, then we also know how, in terms of absolute timing, um, these contaminants would uh, travel. So this is the result. It's actually a, a big cell, 10 meters. So I guess 10 meters uh, is 30 feet by 30 feet by 10 feet that's uh, a reinforced uh, retaining wall, which is on occasion filled with soil, uh, a constructed aquifer. And these individual measuring points would be just capillary tubes that are pushed into it to be able to measure gas concentrations. And what it is is a, a reconstituted sand aquifer. It, it's in Oregon, uh, Oregon Institute of Technology, I think, uh, where they inject mixtures of contaminants and use these capillary tubes at a, at a given time to sample exactly what the concentrations are. So after one day and after three days, so they inject methane, butane, and trichloroethane into this. Uh, it's got water in it to, to sorb the materials in it. And they're merely looking at the rate at which it has traveled. And quite clearly, uh, for the first two, for methane and butane, it's traveled much further than from TCE after a day, and as you continue on past there, it's also traveled much further for those two compounds than it has done after uh, three days. And so you'd expect that the retardation magnitude for this uh, TCE is larger than for the other two. And if the retardation factor is to be larger for one than the magnitudes of the Henry's law coefficient should be smaller, right? 
correspondingly. And so if you look at those magnitudes for each of these, the Henry's Law coefficients work out to be of these order of magnitudes. Same for methane and butane, much smaller for TCE. And so when you divide through by this for the smaller magnitude of Henry's Law coefficient, you get a much larger retardation coefficient. So it makes perfect sense that this has traveled much less far. I don't know if I calculated those magnitudes. No, I didn't. But they're just scaled in, in that magnitude. So we know how to get that. I don't need to do that. Don't particularly need to do that. Yeah, OK. So we said there are two mechanisms of transport. The first was by diffusion which we've spent all our time so far in dealing with. We said that maybe it wasn't as ra effective, perhaps it's more rapid because the diffusion coefficients are quite large, uh, but it, the mass loading isn't as large as if it's carried by aqueous advection. So if we look at this form here, so here we have a, something that's held in place, maybe um, dissolved in water in the Vado zone. Water comes down through here, it infiltrates through this, it picks up a load of whatever it is, and then it carries it down to the water table. Once it's in the water table, it's carried off by the advection in the water table. So what we might like to look at is what the loading might be at the water table from this uh, process. So what we can do is we can look at the geometry of that system. And now that we understand something about the loading coefficients. This is the geometry that we can look at. So the infiltration would be the flux of fluid that comes in as infiltration. Uh, this would be a rainfall amount, say an inch of rain, uh, five centimeters of rain, whatever. The amount that is applied over a, a given area and it's uniform everywhere. So if you look at the infiltration uh, rate, this might be a, a centimeter per year. Uh, I guess around here it would be something like 20 inches a year do we get of rainfall? Uh, or maybe 40 inches of rain, I don't really know what we get around here. Something of that order. But it's the amount that goes into the subsurface. Some of it will be runoff, but some of it will go into the subsurface. So this is the amount that goes in. Since the advective velocity will be the amount of stuff that impinges on the surface divided through either by its porosity, if it was going to put, fill the pore space. But what we are thinking would be that if we have a porous medium at the surface that looks like this, and if the grains that fill that porous medium merely have a certain amount of water present which is coating them. And so the water that comes in through the top, which is this infiltration here, if it wants to get down to the base, it's not traveling through the open pores, which are gas-filled, but it's traveling through the volumetric content of this, which is water-filled. So it's coming at the top, it's going into the water because it has an affinity for the water, which also has an affinity to the grains, and it's being transferred along this water film all the way down through the bottom until it gets to the groundwater zone here. And so the appropriate um, cross-sectional area that it flows through is just the cross-sectional area that's water-filled, which is the same as the volumetric water content. And so the advective velocity as it goes down will be equal to the infiltration rate, 20, centimeter, 20 inches per year, divided by the cross-sectional area of this. The actual mass flux of this is going to be given by the Darcy flux. And the Darcy flux will be the advective flux multiplied through by this, right? So advective flux is just equal to the Darcy flux divided by the volumetric moisture content. Uh, if it was 100% water filled, this would be the porosity, but it's not because we're in the Vado zone. So this is all we're doing. 
We're rewriting this in terms of the, the Darcy flux, which is equal to advective velocity times this. So this term here is the Darcy flux. And we're multiplying it through by the, the amount that's dissolved in the water. This is what we've called before the solubility. Solubility of TCE or whatever it is in water. So this is Darcy flux times solubility. And this is what we've called before the mass flux, mass rate per unit area. Because this is a, just a, a velocity, right? It's not multiplied by the area. So if you multiply this by the area that's going into, that is the footprint of your package that's sitting in the subsurface. So the area of the package would be the area across it. This would be the area. If you multiply it by this area, then it would be a mass removed from the system. So, and that's all we need to do. So, now we know, if we know how much water is going through this, we can calculate if it picks up an amount of material, well, we can calculate the mass loading rate. And I guess the other thing that we might want to calculate is how long it would take to get from this packet at the first time to reach the groundwater table. And so we could calculate that if this is um, a length, then we can calculate Velocity is equal to length over time. So time is equal to uh, length over velocity. And I guess it would be multiplied by retardation coefficient, right? So if we wanted to calculate how long it would take to go from here the first time it goes, then if we know this length and we know the advective velocity, and we knew what our um, uh, what what is called it? our aqueous retardation coefficient is. It would be this one. It's being carried by water, and so it'd be this. If we knew what our aqueous retardation coefficient is, then we could calculate that exactly. So this would be aqueous retardation coefficient. It'll only matter until it gets there, and then it's over, Then just the loading uh, continues. So I guess it would wait until that loading arrived, and then after that, the mass loading would be the same as we would calculate from this. So what we can do is a quick example, um, and it's an example of actually a, from Borden, Canadian Air Force Base Borden, where they dug a hole down, um, and they put a whole bunch of TCE dissolved in water into that hole and then filled it up. It's at residual saturation, so it gets held there. It can't travel. Uh, it amounted to a liter of TCE in this uh, 45 by 30 by 30 centimeter volume. Or actually, six, 16, which is for this volume, 16 liters per cubic meter. And then they sat there while it rained on it, 45 centimeters a year, which is about 20 inches, right? So half a meter is uh, 20 inches. The Vado sown water content was 10%. It was TCE, so the solubility is something like 110 parts per million in water. And ask yourself two questions. Um, it's basically a meter below the surface and two and a half meters above the water table. And so the two questions are, uh, how long does it take to reach the water table? So the aqueous advective velocity would be the infiltration rate multiplied, divided through by the volumetric moisture, moisture content. If the volumetric moisture content is 10%, then it's just the 0.45 meters per year divided by 0.1%, which is four and a half meters a year which to go two and a half meters is about six months. 
unretarded. If it's retarded, which we don't know, then the time would be equal to the time for a conservative sp species multiplied by retardation of the aqueous retardation coefficient, if we knew what it is. So it would be longer, right? Because this number would be bigger than one. So the arrival time would be uh, longer by that proportion. And then the other interesting question to ask is what's the loading from that? So we know that the aqueous loading is going to be the Darcy velocity multiplied through by what we've called before solubility or the aqueous concentration. Uh, and this gives us a mass rate uh, per area because the Darcy velocity is uh, you know, just a, vo a velocity, not per unit area. And so if we take uh, volumetric moisture content, the, Dar the advector velocity, the product of those gives us the Darcy velocity, which is 0 0.45 meters a year, which of course is exactly the same as the infiltration amount. But it's all going down in the, um, uh, the portion which, par which is water saturated. And we multiply through by the solubility for a single component. And it ends up being uh, 450 liters per year if you do the conversions. And so that's per unit area, which is per meter. And so the loading is uh, 0 0.45, 450 liters a year, which is uh, half a kilogram per year per meter squared. Oh, 450 liters is the the volume per meter squared of water. If you multiply through by the solubility, you get the mass loading, which is half uh, times 10 to the 6 milligrams per year, which is half a kilogram per year per meter squared, uh, which is the loading that arrives at the water table, which would occur here on this area. And so if you know what this particular area here is, and I guess we know that it's 0.3 of a meter by 0.3 of a meter, 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters. Then we could calculate what the mass loading is, not per unit per meter squared, but corrected. So I guess this is going to be a third times a third, so it's going to be about a ninth of a square meter. So it's going to be about a tenth of this, 0 0.05 kilograms per year. So. Again, a number of one of our um, back of the envelope calculations. So if we compare that with a calculation done by um, uh, using a model for the same geometry, two meters deep, 2.5 meters to the water table, 10% moisture content, 35% porosity, and therefore 25% gas content. Infiltration of half a meter per year, roughly, and for these different coefficients, but now done with a much more sophisticated model, where you have this zone here, which is the embedded um, component. You have a center line here, uh, which is the middle of the, uh, the packet, if you like. So this you could think of as being a slice of cake. So. Uh, a slice of cake that goes around 360 degrees and so you can solve it on a two-dimensional grid in this slice of cake and you can actually calculate what the distribution of the concentrations are after six months on the left hand side or on the top I guess six months and you see that the concentration is largest closest to the source and it, these are each ten times smaller than the equivalent one as you go out from it and you can look at the same behavior after one year, and you get this. So it's reached some kind of steady state and hasn't changed much. But also from this, from the model, you can calculate since this is the concentration that's in contact with the groundwater table. So this is the water table at the bottom here. You can calculate the mass transfer across this boundary, and it comes out to six kilograms 
has come across is the loading after six months and 16 kilograms is the loading after a year. So you can see from this, um, this is including infiltration of water into this, that the amount that has been dragged down is not very different from the gas contents in here, but if you looked at the concentrations in the water, they'd be much larger, so it's a much more efficient way of taking it down. The fact that this magnitude is more than twice this magnitude, so this is 6 and this is larger than 12, means that there is some effect of advection is that in that it takes some time to arrive here after you start the model because initially this is pristine water that has to be replaced by the stuff that's infiltrating from the surface. So even though it's infiltrating quite quickly, it's not yet at equilibrium. And so this is a thought exercise to look at how do you remediate such sites. So if the big loading from this is occurring by the aqueous transport from the surface down to the water table, then one thing to do might be to stop this aqueous transport. So what you could do is you could put a liner on the surface, which would uh, divert the infiltration so it goes off to the side. If it does that, then it has no way of getting across here to pick this up and to load it. And as a result of that, because the lion's share of the loading is due to the aqueous transport, then you cut it by a factor of more than 10, right? This is about 30 times less. Instead of being six, this is 20 times less. And likewise, uh, for the long term, it's also much less. So by understanding the, which, are the, which are the principal mechanisms by which it gets traveled, carried down to the, the groundwater table, realizing that it's really in the aqueous phase and the gaseous phase doesn't contribute much at all, then by dealing with the main transportation mechanism, just by a very simple remediation scheme, you can solve your problem. And I think that's all we'll talk about. And so, um, if we go back to our little cameos of what we've done, we talked about two out of three uh, mechanisms of transport. We'll only talk about those two. Uh, the other one would be by uh, dense vapors settling by negative buoyancy. And I guess we could also presume that since this is by gas transport, and this is also gas by gas transport, then this mechanism might not big lead to a very big loading. So I guess it's a double-edged sword. Liquid loading would certainly deplete your volume in the Vado zone quickly, but it would also transport it into the groundwater table quickly. And it's much more mobile in the groundwater table. So even though it's depleting it from the, uh, the Vado zone, probably the net benefit is negative because it ends up at your compliance point uh, much earlier. So that's all we'll talk about. And so, uh, yeah, so you just need to be aware of the fact that we have in the Vado zone a gaseous retardation coefficient, which we can define, and that allows us to look at transport in the subsurface. So, um, we're at topic number five, as you see. Uh, before spring break, I guess we have two more periods. We'll talk about modeling. So the way that we've uh, described behavior in the subsurface in this last slide for looking at infiltration or no infiltration all use numerical models. So we divide this area up into a grid of uh, two-dimensional, of a mesh of two-dimensional elements and we can solve that for flow. So we'll talk about a rudimentary way of doing that uh, next time. And then we'll start talking about how, uh, as you're doing in your assignments, now that we know the processes that are going on here, those describe the variables that we need to know. Permeability, solubility, retardation coefficient, porosity. Those are the variables that we want to understand. Everything you've done, you've kind of been given those as numbers to be able to use, but how do we go into the, to a site where you don't know what's going on and you measure those? And so the, the final three topics that we'll talk about, or three periods, we'll talk about site investigation using geophysics and then using drilling and using laboratory techniques to be able to say something about what these different coefficients are. So that will be kind of the end of what we talk about. So we have...
I don't, know, I don't think I, well, this might be an old syllabus, I guess. That's different, yeah. I think this is a the syllabus. So if we look at where we are, we are right here, I guess. We've talked about the Vedo zone. So we'll talk for one period about this, and we'll talk for a couple of three periods about this, uh, and then you're off on your own.